Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is CityWorks, a production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. Every month, CityWorks explores the lives of working people on the job, at home, and in our communities to see in what ways New York can achieve greater social and economic equity. This month, we dedicate our show to women and the ongoing fight for equality we face. Women may no longer be restricted, just a handful of occupations, and sexual harassment is no longer a matter of personal shame, but rather public scandal. But nonetheless, equal pay, childcare, flexible hours, they are still out of reach for most of us. Take from the ranks progress towards gender equality in 153 countries around the world. The U.S. is in a disappointing 53rd place compared to 25th place for Mexico and 19th for Canada. Our discussion today begins with Ellen Cassidy, founder of the 9 to 5 organization back in 1973. From its Boston roots, 9 to 5 has grown into a national organization with members all over the country. Ms. Cassidy is the co-author of 9 to 5, The Working Women's Guide to Office Survival with Karen Nussbaum and The 9 to 5 Guide to Combating Sexual Harassment with Ellen Bravo. She's a former columnist for the Philadelphia Daily News and a former speechwriter in the Clinton administration. Her latest book is Working 9 to 5, a women's movement, a labor union, and the iconic movie with a forward by Jane Fonda. It was released in September. In the second half of City Works, Ellen and I will be joined by Sarita Gupta, Vice President of U.S. Programs at the Ford Foundation and former Executive Director of Jobs with Justice. Our conversation will look at the social and economic currents that have infused the U.S. labor movement around issues of women and work. And I'm just delighted to kick things off with Ellen Cassidy. Welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thanks so much, Laura. So you say that the idea for the book, and let's just talk about the book for a second, came while you were crash, crowded into a crush of women in Washington, D.C., wearing pink pussy hats. That's right. <laughs> right after Donald Trump was inaugurated, I thought, I looked around, I saw all these women, many of whom had never been to a demonstration before. We were crushed. We were, it was an amazing experience. And this reminded me of 50 years earlier, when 9 to 5 was just getting its start. And women office workers, who didn't necessarily feel part of the women's movement per se, were starting to stir. And it was like a sleeping giant awakening. So you take us back to that moment in the book, back the 50 years, and you describe the condition of office workers, as you say, not really part of the women's movement, not really either fitting the stereotypical face of labor, which was still blue collar guys in, industri in mostly industrial jobs. Take us back to what it was like to have one of those office jobs and, and how you felt, what you found out about your fellows as you researched and talked to them. Yeah, so 50 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, 10 of us in Boston sat down and started talking about our jobs. And I was 22 years old. And as you say, at that time, when people thought worker, they thought of a man in a hard hat wielding a wrench. But that was the moment when millions of women were flooding into the workforce. And because of the civil rights movement and the women's movement, people didn't just want a job, they wanted a good job. And so things were really beginning to change. And we looked around us and we found that we had common problems, low pay, unequal pay. We were training men to be our own supervisors, and we were asked to do favors, all kinds of favors for our boss. Like what? Well, like, uh, it's, I mean, I can't even say some of these things. Um, but uh, there was the boss who asked his secretary to sew up a hole in his trousers while he was wearing them. Mm -hmm. There was the boss who fired his secretary for bringing him a, co a corned beef sandwich on white bread instead of rye. Now, I know that that is pretty bad, but she didn't get her job back. Uh, there were people who had to snip their boss's nose hairs, carry his urine sample to a lab. Uh, it went on and on. And there was sexual harassment. There were terrible stories that we heard. Um, bad things happened to me. And I didn't talk about them. I didn't even have the vocabulary for it. And that only came years later. But it wasn't long before we started a newsletter and we started distributing it all over Boston. We got government uh, agencies working on our behalf. We held bad boss contests. But this makes it sound we a little everywhere. bit like you were a, a you know, 
hard-nosed, you know, long-experienced labor organizer. You weren't. Absolutely not. No, I was very young and very green. I got some training at an organizer school called the Midwest Academy in Chicago, and I brought back all my lore after spending a summer learning how to be organized, how to organize. You know, part of it was just being organized, like index cards, wearing a watch, showing up on time. Um, but uh, we started our organization uh, with that training, and then we really just felt our way forward. We went looking for advice from people who knew more than we did, but we recognized early on that we were gonna have to figure this out on our own. And I think that's true to this day for people who are organizing. You can't, you, you should look to learn from history, but you're really gonna have to forge your own path. And we had to throw out lots of assumptions. We thought um, women who were like the most uh, poorly dressed in the office would be the ones who wanted to join a rabble-rousing organization like our own. That was completely false. It was the people who cared the most about their jobs and about how their careers were going. Those are the people who wanted to join 9 to 5. Now, there's also a, a, a racial dynamic in the sense that the office wasn't a place that women of color were able to enter uh, in, in the same time as a lot of white women, but they did increasingly become part of the population you were organizing as the 70s grew on. Talk a bit about how that happened and how that changed your organizing. Yeah, so starting in Boston, Boston was a largely white city at the time. It still is rather that way. Um, and there were only 4% of the clerical workforce was women of color. Um, and that was why we uh, part of the reason why we expanded nationwide to cities where there really was a diverse workforce like Baltimore, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Atlanta. Um, and there we took we, special measures to make sure that everyone, our members, our leaders, our staff, reflected the diversity of the workforce. And we succeeded in building a multiracial and multi-class organization. I'm really proud of that. To give people a sense of how things looked back then and what you all did, here's a clip from some archival footage. Tomorrow is Women's Strike Day, the day that women are being asked to stop typing. Equal pay for equal work when we want it now. Equal pay for equal work when we want it now. A group of secretaries would draw a crowd on any Sunday lunch hour in Boston. About 35 women took over the hallway on the 13th floor. The harassment and the discrimination that has been going on in my office has got to stop. Stop the violation of state law with the use of their illegal application form. He was inspired by the film 9 to 5, where well, we had- he inspired the film 9 to 5. You was, yes, you did. The forces of change have been set in motion, and they've been set in motion by the 9 to 5 organization. Some bosses regard their secretaries as office wives who should be as willing to make coffee as take a memo. But in Chicago today, some of the office wives said they want a divorce. We know secretaries are professionals, and as professionals, their job description does not include making coffee. There are many jobs that females will be qualified for, but they're discouraged from applying for them because they specifically are advertised under male columns. The opportunities are not equal for men and women. Do you work for a living? Yes, I do. Do you feel chained to your typewriter? In a way, yes. I've had several job interviews where people have told me that if I were a man, <laughs> I could have the job. There's a lot of women that are really doing men's work, and I really do believe that they should have the equal rights and the equal pay that a man does receive. Boston has the third lowest pay scale for clerical workers of the 15 largest cities in the United States. And then also things like doing personal errands for the bosses, uh, getting coffee, doing, uh, writing personal letters, things like that, when that's not what we get hired for. The point that secretaries as working people might have legitimate labor grievances is not a new one. What is new is the particular form for dissent. It's not the disembodied voice of the amorphous feminist movement. It's this city's secretaries talking about this city's secretary's problems. Most secretary jobs are dead-end jobs. You better like your life as an office worker because whatever you were doing was what you were going to be doing 20 years from then. Bubbling beneath the surface of this expanding part of the workforce, 80% of which are women, that are at the lowest rung of the ladder of... Uh, of working people, I'm talking about women office workers, there is a 
I don't know if revolution is the word for it, but they're mad. See Jane Fonda at the end there, um, and the references made to the film um, that you inspired, 9 to 5, inspired the movie with Dolly Parton and Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda. And that's maybe the association that a lot of people watching this have, and a good one it is too. But as I watch you watching the original um, footage, I wonder what you're thinking. How does it make you feel to go back there and see what you all did? So proud. In real life. So proud of all the brave women who stood up and said, I want something better and I'm gonna figure out how to get it. We're gonna join together and office workers deserve respect, office work deserves respect. You know, Jane Fonda was very strong on that and it so easily could have gone the other way that, you know, let's get everybody out of the typing pool. That was not really our goal. Our goal was to make sure that at every level, workers, women workers were treated with respect. And the things we asked for, job posting, job training, uh, career ladders, promotion opportunities, childcare, those were things that benefited people at every single level of the workforce, and men too. Now I haven't shared, but my first job while I was at college was going door to door for nine to five. No. In the 80s. <laughs> and I was struck, I was sort of new to this kind of activity, and I was struck how receptive complete strangers were to this message. I'm talking the early 80s, talking about signing the Office Workers Bill of Rights. And that was striking to me, that it didn't take much to get people's interest, the, the male in the family sometimes, but for sure the women, whether they were office workers or not, they could relate to this and they did see this if not part of the women's movement, as part of an equal rights movement. That's right. Um, a lot of women who we met, you know, we went out into the workforce and we, sometimes I had three lunches a day meeting women. <laughs> Whatever it takes. You know, right? <laughs> uh, quite a sacrifice. Um, and people would come in and the first thing they would do before they even had sat down was to say, I am not a feminist. But they were for equal pay, they were for fair treatment for women, and eventually some of those people started to say, you know, maybe I am a feminist. But, you know, we didn't let that vocabulary be a barrier. And we listened very carefully to what people were willing to do and the kinds of ways they talked about their jobs, which meant like challenging a lot of our assumptions. Um, and even things that we thought would be really easy for people to do, like put a stack of leaflets in the ladies' room at your office. A lot of times people were too scared to do that. What if they got caught? Um, it was a very authoritarian culture there and we had to figure out like what will people do? And part of what it was, was we would hand out these surveys. How are you treated on your job? What are your main complaints and so on? How are, how are women treated at the such and such insurance company? People would return the surveys. We, we set up like an anonymous hotline so people could call us and whisper things they wanted to tell us. And then we would take that information, put it on a leaflet, and we'd be out there in front of the company. Not the people who worked at that company, but women who worked at a different co company would stand there and feed that information back, and it drove the executives crazy. How did unions respond to what you were doing? And you did form a union, too. We did. Uh, right from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to provide a union option for women who were ready for it and wanted it. Um, there was very little contact between the women we were meeting downtown in Boston and unions. So we went around, we talked to all the union officials we could find, very few of whom were women, and we put forward the idea that, you know, there's an unorganized workforce waiting out there for equal treatment and better treatment and get out there. And uh, a lot of them just couldn't figure out what we were talking about. Women can't be organized. Women aren't interested in being organized. One guy said to us, you know, that's actually a good idea. And if I could get a girl in here to do my typing, I'd be out there with you organizing. <laughs> you <laughs> did eventually find a right. colleague, an ally. We did. The Service Employees International Union took a chance on us and they gave us our own charter. Eventually we went nationwide. We chose our own campaigns, our own organizers, our own issues to bargain with. Uh, at one university, one of the main issues turned out to be Tampax machines. The Tampax machines had been removed as a cost-cutting measure, and women on the bargaining team, A, were really annoyed about that, and B, noticed that whenever that word Tampax was used, 
the other side, the management negotiators would get so embarrassed that some of them had to leave the room. They got so flustered. So that was a useful issue for us. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a bit about how things stand for office workers now and what the face of the workforce is today um, as we're joined by Sarita Gupta, our next guest. So we're going to be back in a minute with more on City Works, and Sarita Gupta will join us from the Ford Foundation. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies is the 25th and newest school under the CUNY umbrella. Dedicated to public service and social justice, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in the areas of labor studies and urban studies and certificate programs in labor relations, public administration and public policy, healthcare policy and administration, and community leadership. We pride ourselves on being an institution that brings together activists and academics. Find out more at slu.cuny.edu. Welcome back. Well, joining this fun conversation now is Sarita Gupta, who recently co-authored with Erica Smiley, The Future We Need, Organizing for Democracy in the 21st Century, about which we talked on this program not so long ago. I want to introduce you to Ellen Cassidy, who we have right here, Sarita, and welcome you to this conversation. Ellen was just going back to kind of the heydays of the nine to five organizing that she was part of. And I think we were sort of talking about how exciting it was for you to go back there and I wanted to get to where we are today. So I'll start by asking you and then bring in Sarita to, to answer the question of, you know, where do you think we've gotten at this point? Some things have changed. I think the biggest thing is that issues that used to be considered individual issues are now matters of policy, corporate policy, union policy, and public policy. Sexual harassment is illegal. Pregnancy discrimination is illegal. We don't have help wanted male and help wanted female ads in the papers anymore. And management jobs have opened up for college educated women. But in many ways, I would say that it's harder being a worker in today's economy than it was 50 years ago. In the gig economy, people are working two and three jobs just to put food on the table. There's relentless computerized monitoring. There's a relentless pace. Um, fewer people have pensions and paid vacations and, and regular schedules. So um, there are a lot of challenges that, that workers face today. Some of them are the old challenges and some are brand mm. new challenges. Sarita, so how would you assess the landscape for women and equity today? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Laura. It's great to be here. And Ellen, congratulations on your book. So excited mm -hmm. uh, to be in conversation with you. Um, I really agree with Ellen. I think um, a lot of progress has been made and there's still a lot of challenges for women. I mean, women workers continually face, you know, these incredibly hard choices of struggling and barely making it or dropping out of the labor force altogether um, due to not having the kind of bargaining power they need to be successful. Um, and, and so many of the issues that Ellen is talking about are still so prevalent today, you know, everything from the need for higher pay for women to paid leave and issues of care, child care, elder care, um, uh, really will go a long way to support women and women's ability to actually recover um, from this, uh, not only the Great Recession from 2008, but the pandemic. Um, so I think some of these issues, although we have made progress, there's still so much to be done. To what extent has the so-called face of labor where we began changed? I mean, it still seems to me that we think of some kind of white working class that is not all white. We talk about workers and we kind of ignore the attacks on trans workers or immigrant workers or um, is so-called essential workers. Somehow that gets siloed out of our conversation about labor. Still, am I wrong, Sarita? No, you're not wrong at all. That is correct. Often women and many different types of workers in the way that you just described do get siloed out of the conversation. Yet here we are in this really incredible moment where workers are mobilizing. They are taking action. They are organizing right now because they fundamentally want dignity in their work, right? They want to know that they can play a role in governing over the decisions that are impacting them. But also there's a real push right now to say, 
how do we value gendered work as essential? You know, so the so-called pink collar jobs um, that those historically associated with and still primarily held by women actually are among the highest, um, higher than average union membership in terms of occupations, yet we don't talk about that, right? We don't talk about the fact that actually the the number of women who are in unions have now surpassed the number of men in unions. Um, and then you add the racial and gender identity components to it, and we absolutely ignore who are some of the core leaders of the labor movement right now. These mobilizations that we see from Starbucks to Amazon to Dollar General to Microsoft, everywhere, women are actually at the forefront of these movements, and especially women of color. It sometimes seems like, you know, workers win, it's, it's workers, but women lose, it's women. You know. uh, but you're right, it's women workers who are in the forefront. Meanwhile, we're having this attack on women's reproductive rights and reproductive justice, which again is being siloed as if it's not a worker's issue. I'm really heartened right now, Laura, by seeing the reproductive justice movement that has emerged over the last decade or more, actually, that are being, it's largely being led by women of color, but is very focused on low wage, poor women who are saying enough, and we are actually workers too. Um, and so there's so much to be done. Abortion care, reproductive health care is a labor issue. And actually just building on what Ellen said, it matters when you have women in leadership to have President Schuler come out and really talk about why these issues really matter to women workers today is really critical um, progress. Not so long ago, Ellen, the, the wonderful labor and, and feminist journalist Barbara Ehrenreich passed away, the author of Nickel and Dimed, and, and I read an essay that she had written towards the later part of her life, in which she talked about the sort of wealth gap amongst women being so different today from what it was when she was starting out as a reporter in the 60s and 70s and, and early 80s, to the point where she finally concluded she didn't think solidarity among women was even possible anymore. Um, I've drawn people's attention to the fact that the Fortune 500 companies still only have about 6% of women in leadership, but um, I get her point. There's a lot of wealth disparities amongst women. Do you think you could organize nine to five in the same kind of way today? What's your thought about how things have changed? Well, right from the start, uh, we did not extend our membership up into management. So if there were women managers, they were not part of mm -hmm. the nine to five organizing. Um, and we, we definitely were very focused on the issues of people in these office jobs. Um, we helped women rise out of those jobs, but that was not our main thing. Our main thing was to improve life in the typing pool, in the office jobs themselves. So um, to what Sarita said, um, we traced our roots back to the garment women who organized at the turn of the 20th century, whose slogan was bread and roses. So we need bread, we need higher pay, but we also need roses. We need attention to the spiritual side of our lives. And I think actually the kind of organizing that 9 to 5 did with that was really not workplace by workplace, but sort of community-wide, yep. city-wide, very highly publicized, um, that speaks to this kind of uh, sort of bleeding out of um, work lives, community lives, family lives, it's all part of the same thing. The, the joy that you convey in the book and that we saw in the clip and I see on your face as you watch the footage um, also reminds me of how much you were making up uh, on the spur of the moment and how much happiness you really had in the doing of the work. And you talk about the songs that you sang and I, I think that that was a big piece that is perhaps coming back into organizing again yeah, today. We had a ball. We really <laughs> did. We couldn't get enough of each other and we just we really went with it. And we did have our songs and skits and crazy things we did and ways we dressed up and built a huge coffee cup in the middle of Government Center Plaza in Boston. No explanation needed. It was just, you know, and we made countless bosses get their own coffee. <laughs> Sarita, <laughs> do you see that happening today? Kind of invention Abs and joy out absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think people are looking um, for joy and they're looking for joy by joining together with their peers, right? With their colleagues. I mean, that's what 
union organizing is all about. That's what the idea of bargaining is all about, being able to join together and act collectively and negotiate for what you need. Um, and I find that, you know, talking to Starbucks workers and many workers around the country who are organizing today, um, that they are, in fact, bringing in music and and uh, creative, um, you know, art, um, but also different ways to express what they're um, experiencing and what their hopes and aspirations are. Uh, and that's what we need to lean into. If there's anything I've learned in this work um, is how important it is for people today to feel like they have dignity, that they have agency, but that they can actually have joy in their lives. And organizing in the way that Ellen describes from her experience with 9 to 5 to all the different kind of organizing we see today, that's what it's about. Is I feel like sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that. People are taking great risks to organize and they're doing it because they believe they mm. deserve to live dignified lives and they deserve to live with joy. Well, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you both. Um, thanks for joining us, Sarita Gupta, Ellen Cassidy. Thank you. Um, City Works will continue to cover the struggles and also the joys of organizing on the job. If you have questions or comments, write to us at cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For City Works, I'm Laura Flanders. See you next time.